The list is love, sweet love for Valentine's Day. Don't jump to the jewelry aisle. Whether it's your first or umpteenth Cupid celebration. Choosing the right gift. And tempting snacks served with healthy goodness. For kids to eat. And adults, I would eat that. Plus, love could be a stone's throw away with an ancient tradition of casting runes. They offer really, really good insight. But first, sometimes matters of the heart are a numbers game. That's at the top of our love, sweet love list. Hey everyone, I'm Shaguna Dulo. And I'm Christina Guerrero. Valentine's Day is Sunday, so we're calling today's show Love, Sweet <laughs> Love. All about the stuff that makes the world go round and makes our hearts go pitcher patcher. Love is mysterious, ethereal, a kind of magic that's hard to pin down. Yeah, at least until an economist gets a hold of it. Jimmy Rhodes found a number cruncher who's turning love into cold hard data. Right, Loveonomics is our featured story at the top of the list. The famous poem says, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And hey, if love can be counted, it can have all the magic wrung out of it by economists. For a long time, I was rather unsuccessful at dating. So I researched the economics of dating and I call that loveonomics. Dr. Rebecca Grun, a PhD in economics, found the perfect data set for loveonomics in speed dating. You have a lot of encounters, you have a lot of people, so that generates quite rich data. We're running down Rebecca's findings. For starters, Mr. Wright is wrong. Most of our folklore and the Western fairy tales emphasize this image of there's this one prince that will come along or this one princess and somehow magically things fall into place. But the fact is, there is robust evidence that lifelong happy partnerships are possible with more than one person. Some people widowed, they found love again. This insight suggests a strategy. You have to make choices about who is eligible and who is right for you and be very active and intentional about making those choices. About those choices, here's a big who you meet matters more than what you want. Take the speed dating participants. They had expressed preferences about height, age, occupation, weight, whether a person smokes or not. And in the end, 99% were influenced by who they could meet with rather than what their preference was. So for example, they wanted a non-smoker definitely, but only smokers are available. They don't stop making proposals. They just make proposals to smokers then. And start carrying breath mints. So about your type. Our preferences are surprisingly flexible. People adapt their preferences to the opportunities and their environment, not the other way around. So in love as in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. The data show you're gonna settle on whatever's available, so. If you want to choose someone according to your preferences and you know what those preferences are, then you need to deliberately choose the environment where these people roam. It's why during hunting season, you don't see guys running around downtown dressed in camouflage and doused in elk pee. No, you go to where your targets are, so choose places and activities that self-select for your preferences. Whether it's the environment or a sport or a community cause or a faith, when you go to those environments, you likely meet people who you're very compatible with. And if you still can't seem to meet people, you may live in a dating desert. There are places that have a very skewed gender ratio because that determines a bit who has more choice, right? You want to be a straight man where there are a lot of available straight women and vice versa. You don't want to be on the surplus side. With the cities on the US East Coast, you have a very high ratio of women to men and you have a lot of women complaining that it's hard to date or hard to find the right person. And on the West Coast, it's the other way around. Where areas like Silicon Valley are chock full of dudes. If those gender ratios are extreme, you can say you're in a dating desert and you'll feel it. So it might be time to move or go online to connect to other parts of the country. The data-driven wisdom of Loveonomics is at the top of the list. If Valentine's Day has you wondering what to buy your partner, you're definitely not alone. If you go too big, you'll scare them off. Too small, and you might offend them. Not to worry though, we're here to help you find the perfect gift for your perfect person. Valentine's Day is a wonderful opportunity to show your loved one how much you care but it can be loaded with pressure because... Choosing the right gift for where you are in your relationship is of primary importance on Valentine's Day. So to learn the do's and don'ts of Valentine's Day gift giving, we turn to best-selling author and relationship expert, Susan Winter. First of all, try to avoid going overboard with your gifts. 
If you go way beyond where you are in the relationship, you can scare that person off. So Susan says it's imperative to ask yourself where you are in the relationship and match your gift accordingly. If you have a new relationship, don't jump to the jewelry aisle. She says to stick to a smaller gesture like event tickets or a dinner date, whereas if you're in a long-term relationship, an extravagant gift is fine if you can afford it. Next, try not to undergive. Put a little thought into it. Say you've been married 12 years. Valentine's Day comes up and your partner has gone to get you a generic card and written Love Ralph. That's kind of undergiving for all that's been done. So she says plan something that's meaningful to your relationship, like recreating your first date or making a scrapbook of your memories. This will show them that you're keyed into how they think and how they feel and that you're listening to them. Finally, she says think out of the box and gift an experience. Taking time to be with your partner, share time, which is so precious. Focus, no phones, you and your partner, that means a lot. For example, you could go for a drive together, you could take a cycling trip, take a hike together up to a beautiful location, you've got a picnic basket, and you're ready to sit down and enjoy each other's company and just relax and be present. And at the end of the day, if you're really struggling to find a gift, go for roses, chocolate, and a card. It isn't very creative, but it works. Now we can sweep our loves off their feet this Valentine's Day. Move over tarot cards and zodiac signs. There's another ancient way to give you guidance on decisions about life, work, and especially romance. Teresa Strasser looks at the stones called runes and how they can help you find true love. The Vikings, famous for being fierce warriors, were also very superstitious and used runes as both a form of communication and as an oracle. Runes. Runes are short, straight, and diagonal lines that make up an alphabet called the Futhark. More runes. Almost every culture had some form of divination tool or way of getting insight or information. So this is the Viking version of it. I think less about predicting the future with oracles as maybe pointing out hidden motivations that are somehow contributing to your path in life at this point. Astrologer Jim Ventura says that when you get a rune reading, there are three specific stones that have to do with guiding us in affairs of the heart. They offer really, really good insight and direction. We'll start with Gebo, the rune of partnership. When you're in a good space, the partnerships that you bring to you are gonna be a mirror of attributes of yourself. But ultimately, Gebo sort of represents like a gift because it is that opportunity to have partnership relationship in any form and have that opportunity for companionship and self-reflection. With love, all things aren't always roses, as with our next rune, Othila, the rune of separation. The Vikings connected this rune to actually inheritance. But the idea behind the rune is the gain comes from something you must first give up. Maybe it's an aspect of your behavior, that's no longer working. Uh, maybe it is a relationship that's time to exit or make some type of change in. Jim says while change or separation can be painful, it can also be positive. The idea behind Othila is that once you, you create that healthy separation, that retreat, that pullback, then comes the inheritance, then comes the gain. Finally, we're leaving no stone unturned with our last rune, Rado, the rune of journey. If you look at it in, in a tangible sense, it just sort of means like along the way, your travels, your journeys, your experiences in life are what shape you and make you wiser and smarter. Rado can also be interpreted as reunion. Whether that's to parts of yourself or to people from your past or, you know, a great Valentine story when you suddenly reconnected with the love of your life when you were 17 on Facebook. If you want to cast the runes for guidance on love and romance, Jim suggests reaching out to an astrologer, or you can do it yourself. You also could buy a bag and set of runes on your own and begin self-study. There are plenty of resources online to help you, including Jim's website, jimventura.com. Taking the rocky path to learning about love and romance with runestones.
Up next, help your relationship by learning your partner's love language. How we interpret that we feel loved. Then, plan your wedding one TikTok video at a time. I did 13 weddings my first year of business. Plus, have fun making heart-healthy Valentine's Day snacks. Love letter fruit, as easy as it gets. Love, sweet love continues next. Friends, welcome back to our Love Sweet Love Show. Now, if you and your Valentine are in a good relationship, but maybe you're just not clicking on certain things, it may be that you're speaking different languages. We're talking about the love languages, and we are translating so you can have a more harmonious love life. If you're having some communication issues in your relationships, it may be because... Your love languages don't match. Love languages are very important because it's how we interpret that we feel loved, valued, and appreciated by our mate. So there are five. To learn about them so we can better understand ourselves and our partners, we turn to relationship expert Susan Winter. First up, words of affirmation. If you want your partner to keep doing the good things they're doing, you have to keep encouraging them by noticing it and acknowledging their contribution. Some words of affirmation could be, I believe in you, I'm so proud of you. This is an important thing to acknowledge always, the good things that your partner is doing. Next on our love language list is acts of service. Oftentimes the person who doesn't articulate how much they care for you will show you by acts of service. She says this means actions, not words. Whether it's cooking a meal or picking up your dry cleaning or walking your dog when you can't, these physical acts of service show I'm going out of my way to assist you because I care for you. Moving along with receiving gifts. We oftentimes dismiss this category as being superficial or materialistic, and it can easily be construed as such. But she says some people love seeing tangible items to remind us of our loved ones. One where you've really taken time to listen to who your partner is and know what they like. It's because you've listened and you know what's important to them. So it signifies more than just, I'm giving you a gift. Next up, quality time. This gives your partner, who values quality time as their love language, the feeling of being seen and heard and valued and adored. Susan says this consists of turning off your cell phones. Focus time where you are present, so it creates a powerful connection. And our final love language is physical touch. Physical touch is a very strong connector. She says this can include holding hands, touching your partner when they're talking to you. For some individuals, it is the number one love language. Here's to learning more about our loved ones with the five love languages. Wedding season is coming and TikTok wants to help you tie the knot. Teresa Strasser looks at three wedding planners on the video sharing app and they're on the buzz list. Teresa. Thank you, these TikTok wedding planners are helping couples plan their big day for free. Coming in at number one, Vita Chic Events. Another super fun wedding tip. Today we're gonna talk about brooch bouquets. Chava Grant, she's the owner and founder of Vita Chic Weddings and Events. Make sure that your event is organized, beautiful, flawless. Here's a tip for less stress on your wedding day. Number one, hire a day of coordinator. You're not gonna be able to do everything yourself that day. She gives wedding tips and shares answers to the questions she's commonly asked. I get this question a lot about having girls or guys on the opposite sides for their bridal party. All the rules have been thrown out. We're not doing traditional church ceremonies anymore. So if you have a man that you want to be a bridesman or a man of honor, that's totally fine. At number two, Dallas Wedding Planner. Unpopular opinion coming from a wedding planner, part 23. Stop trying to bargain shop or bid out your wedding. Sarah Winterstein is the owner of Sistered States Event Styling. I did 13 weddings my first year of business, just learning the industry, making all the mistakes, and becoming a better wedding planner. She teaches Wedding Planning 101 and shares cute ideas. One of my brides had a gold-plated I do put into the bottom of her shoes. Gives you the I do's and I don'ts. Kids should not be at the wedding. I know they're super cute and we all love them, but they completely kill the mood at the reception. And sometimes, 
she'll spill some tea. I once had a family have me hire an undercover cop to follow the other family at the reception because they didn't trust them. And third on our list of TikTok wedding planners, Laura Beth Events. Brides and grooms out there and couples are fully capable of planning their own wedding. They just need some pointers in the right direction, which is what I do on this channel, my YouTube and in my bride club. She gives money saving tips. Think about spending more on the reception drinks and then allowing your guests to purchase what they want for the rest of the day. Answers questions like, how do you wear your ring? Do you wear your engagement ring with your wedding ring on top or your wedding ring on the bottom with your engagement ring on the top? And shows off wedding attire like these shoes. Beautiful red soles. She even shares stories of her wedding planning mishaps. This one time at a wedding, my first wedding I ever did, a table got set on fire. It was mid speeches. The wedding planners of TikTok on the buzz list. We've got lots more to come. Stay with us. Welcome back. What would a show about love, sweet love be without some love songs? We searched high and low across the decades and genres to find some of the greatest love songs ever on the hot list. There's nothing better than singing a tune and expressing your love to your significant other. And we've got four songs to listen to to get your Valentine's Day weekend started. First up, we're getting groovy and tossing it back to the 70s with How Deep Is Your Love by the Bee Gees. This love song peaked on Billboard's Hot 100 chart at number one for three weeks in 1977 and stayed in the top 10 for 17 weeks. It even made it onto Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. How deep is your love? Jumping decades into the 90s, our next song is I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And I wish to you This signature ballad peaked at number one on Billboard's Hot 100 for 14 weeks starting in 1992 and won the 1994 Grammy Award for Record of the Year and Best Pop Vocal Performance by a Female. You, my darling, you. With over 20 million copies sold worldwide, it is ranked the best-selling single by a female artist of all time. And next up is a song that tied I Will Always Love You for the most weeks at number one on Billboard's Hot 100, I'll Make Love To You by Boys To Men. The 90s classic hit platinum status after selling over 1.5 million copies domestically and was nominated for the Grammy for Record of the Year and won for Best R&B Performance. Last on our list is a tune released 10 years ago, We Found Love by Rihanna, featuring Calvin Harris. Hitting number one for 10 weeks in 2011 on Billboard's Hot 100, this was the longest running number one single of 2011. The single sold 10.5 million copies worldwide and won a Grammy for Best Short Form Music Video. That was the most popular love songs through the decades on the hot list. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our Love Sweet Love Show. One place you'll find lots of sweetness is at school Valentine's Day celebrations. But this year, Cupid has a helper with a healthy side. Heidi Fogel's song teamed up with a teacher to make Valentine treats that go easy on the sugar. Valentine's Day is an especially sweet time for kids, but a savvy second grade teacher is showing her class a healthier alternative to the candy hearts and chocolates. Everybody say mouth. Mouth. Esophagus. Esophagus. Stomach. 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 Great Hearts Academy teachers Skylar Marois and her pal Taylor Brown have three delicious Cupid approved snacks that can each be made in 10 minutes or less. Starting with fruit heart kebabs and dip. I have honeydew melon, cantaloupe, and watermelon. Make one inch slices of each. Then use a heart-shaped cookie cutter to cut out your fruit pieces. Arrange on a kid-safe kebab stick with no sharp points. Just like that. Then mix a cup of yogurt with a few squeezes of honey and a tablespoon of frozen OJ for your dip. Cheers! 
Send a heartfelt and heart-healthy message with Love Letter Fruit, our next Valentine's Day treat. Love Letter Fruit is easy as it gets, and no, they are not Sharpies. We use edible markers, which you can find anywhere that they sell kind of like cake supplies, baking supplies. We found a set for about 15 bucks on Amazon. I'm bananas for you. Skylar says the markers have no taste and that they've been a hit with her students. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so cute. Aren't you glad we are together? We make a great pair. We're wrapping our list with a grin. Graham Cracker Smiles. Start by chopping some strawberries in half, then cutting into hearts. You can just use a knife and just kind of cut out a little triangle at the top. Then add a layer of peanut butter to the graham crackers. You can also use like almond butter or sun butter mm. if you're allergic to peanut butter. Then finish with a chocolate morsel smile. Such a fun things. treat for kids to eat. It is. And adults, I would eat that. For these recipes, hit up Skylar and Taylor's Instagram page at Teachers Talk Wellness. We're canning the candy and reaching for the healthy Valentine's Day treats. You know, my kid loves sweets, but those treats would absolutely satisfy his little sweet tooth. Oh, you're one of those parents who gives their kids candy. Hmm, interesting choice. What else are you supposed to bribe them with? Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching.